This section is on knowledge, which is uh, basically how are we storing things in memory? So we've talked about um, attention and perception and imagery. Now we're getting into the more nitty gritty of what and how are things stored in memory. Um, so we're going to start with the very basics of representations and how representations are structured. And then we'll move into categories, which is like groups of representations, and then more on the specific types of memory um, in Module 8. <clears throat> so to start, I'm going to talk about knowledge overall. What is knowledge? Uh, the representation types, uh, so all the systems. And then the next section, 7.2, is uh, category knowledge. So how are things structured in memory? So what is knowledge? I mean, if you think about it, what does that mean? I mean it sounds like one of those um, uh, GRE questions, mm -hmm. what is knowledge? Um, and so it's really just information about the world stored in memory. So this could be your third birthday. It could be who won the World Series. It could be who went first in the NFL draft. It could be what color. Um, what is your favorite color? Um, so the, I, when you get to thinking about it, um, we have a lot of international students, so they'll be taken to a football game and they're very confused because that's not what they think football means. Um, so how could you go and do things if you didn't know what they were? Uh, so knowledge is really all that information stored in memory that you take for granted. Like You know that chairs are for sitting. Well, how do you know that? Well, it's stored in memory somewhere. <clears throat> So to get into uh, how knowledge is represented, remember that representations are physical states that stand for some type of information. So that's old news, but we're going to come back to it. <clears throat> but representations really have two parts. They have to be uh, intentional and information carrying, which I have on this next slide. <clears throat> so the intentionality criterion is that representations are constructed on purpose. So we store this knowledge for a reason. It's not just random stuff. And I know you might think that a lot of your knowledge is sort of random facts, but they were stored for a reason. Um, and so uh, your brain tends to store information automatically, even when you're not trying. So that's kind of cool for you. Um, but there is usually some sort of unconscious goal. So why would you store that information if you didn't need to? So um, we'll get both conscious storage studying and unconscious storage. More on that in the long-term memory section. Um, uh, so the ability to store information so is evolutionary. So we can't um, mm -hmm. leave the job to basically consciousness. And so the storage of information is pretty important. <clears throat> Oops, sorry, back up. So the other thing that's important for a representation is that it carries information. So it has to be intentional, which we've already said is kind of out of your control. And then um, it has to have some sort of information. So that information might be of your friend's birthday, but it also might be that stop signs are for um, are red to help you stop so you don't hit anybody. So information carrying can be... Um, either super important or see things that don't seem to be important. <clears throat> right. So four different ways that we can do this. <clears throat> We're going to talk about module um, modalities, sorry, specific, so images. Feature records are the weird ones that people don't really get. Um, amodal symbols are definitely the weird ones. And then more on neural nets. So we started talking about neural nets in chapter one, I think, and uh, explaining that they're, they're the understanding of the patterns in the brain. So trying to mimic the brain. Um, so it's a, a uh, computational model. And so we'll get more into how those work. <clears throat> so first one um, is the uh, modality specific stuff. So uh, one aspect of representations are their format. So that's a little bit of the intentionality and the information carrying part. So it's not only just the way that um, represents, representations are arranged when we get into categories about how they're kind of hierarchical, but it relies on the processes that are used for the representations. How do we get the information out once we've stored it? Um, most representations are modal. I can't say that word. Modality specific, um, 
and that means that they're either perceptual or motor, back to the imagery section, that things are either visual, verbal, or motor. And they may be amodal. So what does amodal mean? That means that they are uh, separate from perceptual and motor. And that's weird for a lot of people to think about sometimes because what are things if not perceptual? So we are very perceptual things, uh, people. Uh, we see and hear and touch and move in our environment. So sometimes it's hard to think about things that aren't any of those. Uh, I always think about these as computers. Computers are binary systems, right? Everything is one and a zero. That would be more of an amodal kind of system. <clears throat> more on that in a minute. So starting first with imagery. <clears throat> um, the uh, modality specific, got it right this time, and thinking about images. Uh, images have three parts. So the spatio-temporal window is the uh, time-space arrangement, uh, storage units, and stored information. So spatially, there are um, just tons of you know, pictures that a camera could take. Um, and so we tend to uh, see things in a, a specific spatial arrangement. Uh, Time-wise, it's not that we um, record like a video camera. We don't work that way. Uh, we record in sort of like little short bursts, and so it's more like pictures. So any image is defined by the fact that there is a specific camera angle and a specific snapshot of what's going on. <clears throat> so an example. Um, let's say we have this table with the birthday cake on it. So the spatio-temporal window um, is viewed at a specific angle. Um, within that window, um, if you think about cameras, we're talking about pixels, so the light of uh, the light representation, and so that's kind of what this little picture down here is trying to get at. It's that angle with those feature detectors. So each pixel stores information about the intensity of the light across them. So we're really breaking this down into how vision works, right? So we've talked a lot about the feature um, on, off, on, 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 off, off, on cells, um, color detection, that kind of stuff. So put together, all of these light intensity wave things put together equals birthday cake on a table. Um, <clears throat> so the window is the fact that we shot it from this angle and we got a quick snapshot. The stored information is how all of those um, light pic pictures come together. So those are the storage units and the stored information is how those uh, light windows are arranged. That seems really complicated, but that's the way the picture a picture might work. <clears throat> So, in thinking about um, these image pieces, what we've got here on the, um, the left is a mm -hmm. stimulus that was shown to a monkey. So, it's spokes on a wheel. It's kind of supposed to mimic a bicycle. On the right here is brain activation. So, if you remember, I talked about retinotopic mapping. So uh, things that appear in a certain area on your visual field also appear in the same area in your parietal and occipital lobes. So remember, it's upside down and reversed. But what's going on in B is that's a slice of V1. So V1 is the visual center. Um, and you get the same picture. So the idea is that we've got that same representation of those spokes in the brain um, as part of retinotopic mapping. So those are all the areas that are activated when I'm looking at A. So we're only getting one half because this is the left visual field. Um, and uh, check out how awesome it is that the representation in the brain matches the picture. So back to this storage units slide, each one of these little light cells is going to create that picture of a cake is what's going on. How neat is that? So that's retinotopic mapping. <clears throat> um, so we've got in this one selective attention. So there are some things we can encode better than others. So we've got this birthday scene, this little kid having birthday party. So there's our fancy cake again. Um, so uh, rather than us uh, representing this as a, as we would imagine a picture, um, we tend to uh, represent the things that are more important to the overall story um, better. 
So if you're thinking about birthdays and um, a birthday party, the important part in the story is actually the cake because that's what's common to birthdays and the presents because presents. Um, <clears throat> so those things are more important so they're getting a higher resolution. So over here on the left, or I'm sorry, on the right, mm -hmm. what it's trying to represent is that you're getting the cake more because that's the important part of birthday parties. And then everything else is kind of washed out because who cares about the people at the party? It's all about the presence. Okay, so an unequal distribution of attention will cause us to represent images in a slightly different way because of what we're focused on. Okay, so back to the attention chapter. <clears throat> um, and so uh, when you are talking about <clears throat> uh, images in the brain, so uh, over here on A is the, uh, the dorsal view of the brain, so the bottom, um, and that's the what system, remember. And it is showing what part of your brain is activated when you're thinking about a horse. So thinking about horses. Okay. After the surgery, um, because <clears throat> um, we've removed this right hemisphere's um, occipital lobe, what happens is the um, picture gets smaller because we only have half the brain working on it. So imagery um, really is based on what the brain is doing, right? And so our picture, our stored representation is going to be smaller. So that's why the horse gets smaller over here because you've only got half the brain to do it. <laughs> All right, so imagery is represented. We did pictures, but it can also be... Um, <clears throat> um, Wow, brain fart. It can also be verbal, okay? And it's hard to imagine words not looking like pictures, but they are separate things. <clears throat> uh, so feature records. Feature records are um, sort of how we categorize things that are meaningful. So meaningful entities are objects or events that are important in our survival or in our goals. So when we talk about memory, we're talking more about survival processing, but it's pretty important. And then goals, so where we're trying to get so um, when you're talking about the pixels that we just finished with, that's pretty meaningless. Um, we just know it's a pattern of uh, our areas of neural activation, and so these patterns of pixels. So how do we represent meaningfulness? <clears throat> okay. um, so this is where the feature record stuff comes in. So here's our frog, and um, what happens is the the neurons over here on the left. Wow are representing um, um, motion in response to this object, which is the delicious dinner for the frog. Um, and then the ones on the right here are responding to the what system, uh, delicious dinner. So motion, delicious dinner. Um, together, those two create a meaningful representation of eat this, uh, eat this mosquito. Um, and so feature records are the idea that we have uh, parts of, it's kind of like feature integration theory. We have parts of the brain that process all these different um, things, color, motion, uh, where, what. And um, the feature record is the one that puts them all together and says, this is what's going on. This is why it's meaningful. <clears> okay. <throat> <Hey. clears throat> So for visual input, there are lots of different things. So here's our parietal lobe and our occipital lobe. And so I've told you we process all these things differently, but now you've got an idea of what's going on. Um, so color is down here. Um, orientation, the spatial system is processed here. Shape here, motion here. So all of these are parts of the parietal occipital lobe um, and a little bit of temporal lobe here. Um, that control like where and what and how and who. Uh, and what happens is that then goes to the front of the temporal lobe where the uh, temporal lobe puts it all together. So the conjunctive neurons in that area combine everything to form that feature record. Here's what's going on. I've got this and this and this and this, therefore presence, right? <clears throat> so with, um, with feature records, what we're really getting into is how we create a mental picture of all those images put together. <clears throat> so amodal symbols, this one's really different. So uh, modality specific representations are either based on our perceptual systems or our motor systems and it's put together by the feature records. 
A modal systems are arbitrary and ab abstract. Okay, um, this is difficult to test because we are so perceptual, and so people believe we have these things, but it's kind of hard to get at. Okay, so let me give you some examples. <clears throat> so, a frame in an A modal system is sort of like an algorithm that specifies the relationships of objects in an environment. The uh, book is on top of the table. A semantic network um, diagrams a frame, but not uh, visually. And a property list is a list of characteristics belonging to something. Okay, so these are supposed to be amodal systems. We're going to talk about property lists in the next section on categories. Semantic networks are the neural net models. And definitely we're going to talk about frames when we talk about schemas. So these are supposed to be sort of regardless of picture. <clears throat> So, kind of a representation of what's going on. So, um, it might be spelled out like this. So, um, the above, left of, gifts, uh, and cake is the table. So, the, tab the uh, gifts and cake are above the table, as in they're on. Um, and so, uh, gifts are left of the cake over here. Cake, we've got represented as a list of features here and see it's got frosting, it's got candles, it's sticky and it's sweet. Um, so uh, A, A is this part up here at the top, uh, the top middle, is the sort of frame. And so it kind of looks like computer code because that's the way we're sort of trying to represent it. Um, B is a picture a map, if you will, of what's going on. A cake, uh, the feature list is just a list of the things that make a cake a cake. Um, <clears throat> so more on amodal networks when we talk about categories and how they're hierarchical. Uh, last uh, idea for representations of knowledge is these statistical patterns. And this is really not that different from a feature record, but it's more centered in what the brain's actually doing. Okay, so we're coming back to neural nets. Neural nets are those models that are trying to represent neurons firing. And it's really thinking about this as computer code. So mm. um, it's usually tied to the sort of amodal systems. So why is it a stati statistical approach? Well, the idea is that um, we have all these neurons that are firing and they form a pattern and this pattern equals presence because we're gonna talk about presence in this uh, demonstration. So the statistical approach is more, um, it matches what the brain is doing a little bit better. So it's sort of a convergent validity. And um, multiple patterns can represent the same category. And that's actually pretty important. So I have two dogs that you may hear barking since I'm recording at home. Um, that uh, One's a beagle and one's a collie. Those are different types of dogs, but they still represent my same dog category. So the pattern of activation in my brain for dog includes both of those. And so that it makes um, it pretty flexible so I can have both. And they're, they're each a separate statistical pattern, but it represents the same category. Um, and so uh, simulation is that I can ask you to imagine your 16th birthday and because um, it's pretty important to people driving that kind of stuff and I can reactivate the image and all those feature records even though that scene isn't present anymore clearly because we've moved on but you can um, you can bring up that memory that representation because uh, we know the stored pattern for it and that's gonna be really interesting when we talk about what happens when you forget things so these stored patterns are supposed to be a combination of everything at once the images themselves, the feature records of saying, yes, this image and this image go together, therefore presence, um, and the amodal representations of on, above, that sort of thing. <clears throat> so neural nets are supposed to be kind of the catch-all of representations. <clears throat> okay, so neural nets are these specific patterns. So cake has this very specific 101010 pattern, um, and they're representing the neurons either firing or not. <clears throat> Um, and so those patterns are um, simulated down here at the bottom. And um, what happens is you'll train a neural net model with this picture. And so that picture um, is either neurons firing or not. And you get this pattern. If we then test the model, that's the bottom half here. Um, with that pattern, what does the model say? And it says cake. 
Okay, so simulation is just when we run the model, giving it um, a new pattern and see what happens. <clears throat> And so in the next section, what we're going to talk about is categories. And so what we've done is we've built up how, how are things represented um, knowledge-wise, and now we're going to get into how they're structured, which is what categories are.